because that means they are permanently, entirely, completely separated from the God who made them and loves them. If there are lost people, that is a terrible tragedy. And Jesus seemed to think there were. Look at this next verse. In John chapter 3, 16 through 18, it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of of God's one and only Son. That last line is scary. It says, whoever does not believe stands condemned already. The day of judgment hasn't come, but that person who doesn't believe is already good as condemned because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I'm not saying this. The Bible's saying this. And you get to choose whether or not you want to believe this. But the Bible says that those people who don't believe that Jesus is God's son, that he is who he said he was, that he came to this earth, that he died for them, that he was risen for them, the Bible tells us that if people don't put their trust in him, they are condemned and distant from God. We don't like to think of these kinds of things in the context of refreshing other people because we want to be all about what Jesus was all about, right? I mean, he was loving everybody. He was healing people. And we forget that Jesus was a guy who came to this earth to draw a line in the sand between those who were found and those who were lost. And those who are lost are on the other side of this line that says condemned. And those who are found are on this side of the line that says saved. And Jesus came into this world to seek and to save those who were lost. His entire purpose, that means if you and I are going to be refreshing kinds of people, we need to enter into the most refreshing activity that has ever been done, and that is the activity that Jesus himself did when he came to this earth to seek and to save the lost. I'm going to prove to you how refreshing this is. So maybe you can get to this place where you could say, okay, yeah, I, I get it. I understand that this is actually a benefit to people. And we're going to look in Luke 19. You're already there if you've turned to 729. And so we're at Luke 19, and we've already read one of the verses, Luke 19.10. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. But we're going to find out how the story builds up to that point. So start in chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Stop there for just a second, and I need to explain a little bit about what Zacchaeus was, not just who he was. It, it tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Now, most likely what that meant is that Zacchaeus was a Jewish person who had sold out his friends, family, and fellow countrymen. Because a tax collector was charged by the emperor of Rome to extort money from people, to keep a percentage, and to send a certain amount to Rome. And we don't know all the details of how this procedure really happened because there isn't a whole lot of uh, documentation on that kind of stuff. But, but we have a good idea that basically what that meant was that Zacchaeus had a responsibility to pay Rome a certain amount of money for the people in his area, a certain amount of money for a certain amount of time. And if he, ca if he gathered any more than that, he could keep it. So here's the technique of the tax collector. I'm going to try to get as much money from you as I possibly can because all the money over and above what Rome asks for, I get to keep. But you don't know how much money Rome asked for. I'm the only one who knows how much money Rome asked for. So if you don't pay me everything I'm asking for, I can have you thrown in jail or killed. That's the power of the tax collector. He had this threatening force over his fellow countrymen. And if Zacchaeus was a Jew, and we know the uh, good number of the tax collectors were Jewish people, then the people around him would have perceived him as a very reprobate individual. 
Everyone would have, saw, would have seen him as a lost person, a sinner, a terrible person. So here's the deal. Zacchaeus was lost. He was selling his soul and he was selling his countrymen for money. But Zacchaeus didn't know it. He was wealthy. He had everything his heart desired. Maybe you know some people like that who from the outside, you look at them, you look at their lives, and they've got everything going on. They've got the good family, they've got the good house, they've got the good cars, they've got all the trappings of wealth. They, they seem like their lives are going smoothly. The authorities are always on their side. Maybe you know some people like that. And you don't know beneath the surface whether or not they're lost. You don't know beneath the surface whether or not they're as bad as Zacchaeus was. The people of Zacchaeus' day knew what he was doing. And so they, they saw him as a lost person. But Zacchaeus with his friends, I mean, he was, a, he was just a normal good tax collector. He'd just done his job really well and he, now, he was now a chief tax collector. So here's the thing. How do you find a person who doesn't know they're lost? We'll see what Jesus does. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up into this tree and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All Jesus did was, dude, we're going to hang out. Right? He said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to spend some time with you. Now, this is huge. Because Jesus was a Jewish guy, a Jewish rabbi, he was a good guy. Zacchaeus was a reprobate, low-level dude. And for, for Jesus to spend time with Zacchaeus was terrible. I mean, look at the next verse. It says right there, but all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus is a terrible guy. Why would Jesus spend time with Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus is a sinner. If you're going to spend time with anyone, spend some time with some good people. Spend some time building up some of these other people around you or, or some of these other people who need to be healed, some of the sick people. But Zacchaeus had money. He could afford doctors. He had everything going for him in the physical world. And he had nothing going for him in the spiritual world. Leave him alone, Jesus. He doesn't need you. Jesus goes. And look at the very next verse. Verse 8. I love this. But... Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord. And now, all of a sudden, we found ourselves maybe an hour later. I don't know how much later because verse 7 is the people muttering while Jesus has gone. So Jesus is now gone at Zacchaeus' house. Verse 7 takes place. Now we're at verse 8. We've transported